Welcome to the first event of the speaker series, the spring speaker series in the philosophy department. My name is Sarah Tyson, I'm an assistant professor here in the philosophy department. Um, and it's really my pleasure to welcome Michelle Comstock, an associate professor of English here at UC Denver. And you specialize in rhetoric and composition, that's kind of your focus in the English department. Um, and Michelle is the author of numerous works, including the book Composing Public Space, Teaching Writing in the Face of Private Interests, with Will Brannan and Marianne Kane. Um, and the essay Composing for Sound, The Art of Social Resonance, with Mary Hawks, which is forthcoming from Kairos? Um, no, actually, I was oh. sending that somewhere else. <laughs> oh, okay. It's forthcoming. It's accepted and forthcoming. No, it's not. That's not okay. Um, well, okay. But it's forthcoming. <laughs> so we'll look Yes, it is. Um, her talk today is entitled The Sounds of Climate Change, Sonic Rhetoric, and a Volatile Age. So please help me welcome Michelle Thompson. This is so exciting. Um, can you hear me? I'm going to stand up most of the time so I can project back there. Um, this is so exciting to be local because I can thank actual people in the room. Sarah has read probably 20 drafts of this. <laughs> <laughs> and so has Bo, who is has been working with me on Sonic Research. And some of you have heard it in various forms, too. So thank you. Um, for giving me the opportunity to share the work and to focus on it for a while, to put the English department schedule aside for a couple of weeks and get back into this, which I needed to do. So I'm very appreciative. Um, this past Thursday, I was meeting with one of my fellow composition instructors, and she told me that climate change was banned from all the composition <laughs> courses, that no one can write about this topic anymore. And I thought, wow, I wouldn't even pass my own 2030 course at this point. Um, it's banned along with abortion, gun control, and death penalty. I understand why they do that. I mean, politically, I don't, but I sort of understand why comp instructor, instructors do that. Because so much has been written about climate change, right? We, we turn around and we see another article about the end of the universe, or at least Earth. Um, however, most of it so far has been fairly visual. And um, this is one of those iconic photos from Inconvenient Truth that we often, we, we, when someone says carbon um, levels are going up, we imagine this chart, those of us who went to see the movie, or have seen Al Gore presented since then. So this is one of those iconic photos. Um, also, a lot of you may be involved in Facebook and Instagram on the ground exchange of environmental um, justice concerns like the BP oil spill in the Gulf Coast. Most of that was recorded by residents on the beach, not by the BP um, oil executives. And these photos were exchanged to show that, yes, indeed, there's still oil in the Gulf Coast. It hasn't been cleaned up. <coughs> um, and then the other photos we often see are of Distressed animals. This was one that came out just this year with 30,000 walruses stuck on an Alaskan beach because um, there wasn't enough ice, Arctic ice, for them. Um, when we think of the issue of climate change, our minds may immediately go to those dramatic graphs and charts demonstrating the exponential growth of carbon in the atmosphere, or the oil spill, or the stranded animals. Now, these visual representations of climate change communicate risk urgently and importantly to what rhetoricians might call stakeholders, those human inhabitants of threatened areas, policymakers, and corporations. As feminist eco-critic Stacey Alamo argues, our increased act access to photography and documentaries actually empowering at-risk communi community members. They can provide evidence of toxins in their environment in a way they couldn't before. Indeed, images showing toxicity in the ground, water, and air, and this includes blueprints and readouts, make the invisible visible, and thus more material. And in, this is a necessary move for mobilizing at-risk populations. You know, the seeing is believing. Sound or sonic information, however, is rarely considered a rhetorical, and for the rhetoricians in the room, I'm, de I'm defining that as simply persuasive. <coughs> or the art of finding persuasive means 
available means of persuasion than in the Aristotelian sense. Um, sonic information is rarely considered rhetorical or persuasive for communicating the ongoing effects of climate change. Alemo, in fact, I had a conversation with Alemo, Stacey Alemo, and she said she didn't know of any work that had been done in this area. That's either a good sign or a bad sign, I don't know. Um, Alemo notes that while photography has served as a powerful conveyor of damage and risk, many environmental justice problems cannot be visually discerned nor photographed, but in fact require multiple modes and technologies to make them perceptible. I argue that sound, especially recent work in the subfield of sound art, is particularly useful for understanding and community, communicating our currently volatile experiences of climate change and extinction. One of the key assertions in recent debates over climate change is the Anthropocene hypothesis, which suggests that humans in the last 100 years have become the, human, have become the driving power behind planetary transformation. And if humans are now judged as a force capable of disrupting climate patterns on the same scale as a meteor or a volcanic eruption, then we need rhetorical resources that help us embody and make sense of these large-scale physiological and phenomenological shifts. Recent pieces by sound artists like Susan Phillips, and then I'm going to show a sound piece by um, Bernie Krause, both of their pieces highlight the potential of sound to do just that sort of rhetorical and cultural work on that scale. <coughs> Leading sound artists craft soundscapes through various delivery systems, including outdoor installations, museum showings, CDs and records. They create soundscapes that bring our bodies into dissonant and resonant relationship with our environments. Phillips, for example, fragments and layers literary and historical soundtracks over vulnerable islands and coastal regions in order to disorient listeners from their usual auditory tactics. And I use that um, term from Baudou, um, defining auditory tactics as those largely unconscious ways we navigate using sound in our environments. <coughs> in disrupting those tactics, Phillips cultivates a strong awareness of your immediate landscape as an active and resonating, sensitive interlocutor rather than as a passive landscape or resource. I'm just going to play a couple minutes of her piece, Lowlands, but I'm going to analyze it a bit more later, so we'll come back to it. Phillips, Bernie Krauss uses sound, the other artist I'm going to talk about, to revitalize the natural and built environment, but does th so through amplifying, dissecting, and documenting, documenting pre- and post-anthropocene ecosystems into kind of postcard sound files, allowing the <coughs> listener to nostalgically capture and store what has been lost. And this is just a couple minutes from his piece. He published a multimedia piece in the um, New, York, New York Times last year. Yeah. <laughs> 
That was the pre-logging and this is the post-logging. The same sounds good. One year later. Both of these sonic practices are useful, but Krauss's recordings encourage empathetic conservation, while Phillips's installations transform our very sense of what is human versus non-human. Phillips' work helps us imagine human corporeality as transcorporeality, a reality in which the human is always intermeshed with a more than human world, and highlights the extent to which the substance of the human is ultimately inseparable from the environment. Before I analyze Phillips and Krauss in more depth, I want to first make the case for sound as a significant rhetorical and ethical resource with the ability to immediately shape our sense of time, place, and self. While the material turn in rhetorical <coughs> studies has prompted us to include a wider range of rhetorical conditions beyond the text, like um, the artifacts and institutions and delivery systems of any message, sound has resisted our largely print-based methods of analysis. I would say especially in literary studies and rhetoric. Of course, part of this is due to the print-based formats of scholarly publication. Thus, we've seen the rhetorical study of sound become more robust as our publications have become more multimodal. In addition to the format limitations, the difficulty of representing sound as material, like the printed page, or as rhetorical, like a public speech, may relate more generally to its pervasiveness. A pervasiveness beyond what we might reductively call the act of hearing or auditory processing. Even humans who are hearing impaired experience a wide range of vibrational input through various senses and have never experienced, at least physically, absolute silence. Anywhere, anywhere there's energy, including the depths of intergalactic space, is a vibratory region claims neuroscientist Seth Horowitz. The difficulty of representation may also stem from hearing's near universality among vertebrates. There are no normally deaf animals, argue, argues Horowitz, which then leads them to ask, if hearing is so crucial, why do we humans so often ignore it as a con at a conscious level? Perhaps the very significance of sound processing to the vitality of the human organism renders it more tacit and thus vulnerable to the less vulnerable to deliberate sense-making. According to Horowitz, it's this faster-than-thought auditory speed with a wide range of tones and timbres that visual color cannot hope to match, and greater flexibility than the chemical sensitivity of taste and smell that lets sound underlie and drive a fantastic range of subconscious elements in the living organism. For example, our subconscious ability to background some sounds and not others, what scientists call the cocktail party phenomenon. We hear somebody mumble our name from across a very noisy room. Remains largely unexplained by scientific research and medical professionals who admit they know very little about how an, individual, an individual's auditory system separates signal from noise. Indeed, a whole industry built around active listening has exploited the human and cultural pro problem of not being able to focus on one sound object for longer than a millisecond. In Sonic Warfare, <coughs> scholar and musician Stephen Goodman outlines an ontology based on this theory of vibrational force. He, like Horowitz, argues for vi vibration as the essential quality of the universe. And I'm going to show you the longer quote because this is kind of a key argument for my analysis. I tried to re minimize the window, but another the argument. Try, um, try escaping out of full view, okay. and so we just sort of see. Yeah, just okay. All right.
Kuhlman's ontology specifically challenges the linguistic imperialism that subordinates the sonic to semiotic registers, thus losing sight of the more fundamental expressions of their material potential as vibrational surfaces or oscillators. In developing his ontology, Goodman avoids, on the one hand, naive physicalism, which reduces the sonic to a quantifiable objectivity, and on the other hand, a phenomenological anthropocentrism, which neglects the agency distributed around a vibrational encounter and ignores the non-human participants of the nexus of experience. So Goodman does isolate and privilege hearing over other senses that are, in fact, sensitive to vibration. Goodman's claims for this distributed agency of vibrational encounters remains useful for my argument, for sound as rhetorical resource for understanding and communicating transcorporeality. Goodman writes, Vibrations always exceed the actual entities that emit them. Vibrating entities are always entities out of phase with themselves. A vibratory nexus exceeds and precedes the distinction between subject and object. In other words, sound requires what Alemo terms more capacious epistemologies that emphasize the material interconnections of human corporeality with the more than human world and allows us to forge ethical and political positions that can contend with numerous 21st century realities in which human and environment can, no, can by no means be considered separate. So, for example, um, chemical sensitivity is one <coughs> phenomenon she analyze, analyzes. Although he doesn't call it phenomenological anthropocentrism, rhetorician Thomas Rickard does bemoan rhetorics emphasis on salience, the things we are conscious of, over vibrational elements outside our human consciousness. In his recent book, Ambient Rhetoric, he writes, rhetoric may give priority to the expressly salient, but the salient must take part in and emerge from the ambient. Attention attends to the salient, but the bringing forth of salience is itself a complex activity that has ambient dimensions. This poses a problem when the salient is taken for all that there is or all that matters in a rhetorical situation. <coughs> Given Rickert's insight of, insights about ambience, we could characterize musicians, composers, and sound artists as longtime writers of sound engaged in the conscious process of making ambient noise matter and the human voice material. For example, amplifying the human heartbeat, mechanizing the low frequency hum of traffic, and recording, layering, and auto-tuning the human voice, making it a sound object. Such activities have political and ethical as well as aesthetic impact. For example, it is only in making the vibrations of fracking or traffic material that they are understood as toxic and thus worthy of regulation. It seems strange that we still have to make the case, along with communication scholar Elizabeth Lopari, that listening takes place in the body, and thus sound can have as much effect as toxic chemicals. Artist, activist Gordon Hempton, who Sarah um, turned me on to, his project is to create and maintain one square inch of silence in Olympic National Park. It exemplifies the difficulties of identifying and regulating sound as a material agent. Only by quantifying it, one square inch, does Hempton make natural science, silence material and thus potentially valuable and destructible at the same time, making it material. Despite over a century of sonic <coughs> innovation by artists like Hempton, museums, juries, and universities have been slow to label sound as a legitimate artistic medium driving many sound artists to continue making explicit arguments for its materiality and its capacity for manipulation. Sculpting sound and interrupting the conventional auditory tactics of passers-by, especially in outdoor public spaces like um, what Phillips did, is a formidable task, and it's disrupting the disciplinary boundaries between music and art. Phillips, the first sound artist to win the prestigious Tate Museum's Turner Prize in 2010 for the um, 
installation I just showed you, she continues to disrupt these boundaries along with the larger ones between nature and culture, the ones that inform our discourses of climate change. While Phillips and Krauss may not identify themselves as integral voices in the Anthropocene debate, the work does provide us strategies for monitoring and regulating human impact and for understanding culture as a so-called force of nature. And here I'm gonna move just to an analysis of these pieces, so I'm gonna go a little deeper in them and then conclude. The rhetorical project of making sound materials evident in Krauss and Phillips, but in radically different ways, with, with Krauss amplifying human impact on environmental soundscapes, and Phillips attending to the very meaning-making processes humans bring to the act of hearing. Philip also uses sound to alert us to our immediate environment. In her most celebrated installations, and they're not really installations, so we need a new term for them. These environments are the disorienting, liminal, and now most threatened places where water and land meet. I put Phillips and Krauss in dialogue just to identify how they sonically archive extinction differently. As I've mentioned, Phillips is known for fragmenting and layering sounds of history and their various te temporalities within the environment in order to interrupt our habitual movements through time and space. Her recordings create a cyclical, looping sense of time, as opposed to a direct, directional, progressive one often employed by passers-by. In that piece, I played you the lands, um, which she installed under the three bridges of the Clyde River in Glasgow. Her recorded voice sings a 16th century Scottish ballad called Lowlands Away in three different parts. That's why you heard, heard, heard the overlay. It wasn't just the four speakers on my computer. It is a literal as well as figurative haunting with the reanimation of the song's narrator ghost, the voice of a sailor killed at sea, visiting his love one last time. And I'm just going to play a couple more minutes of it. Unadorned and untrained female voice creates a haunting that is abruptly intimate and personal, even in the shared public corridor of the bridge. Public space suddenly becomes private and shared at the same time. And the river and bridge become less a landscape that one faces <coughs> and simply moves past and becomes an immersive environment instead. Here one resonates with Philip's recorded voice, the stones of the bridge, the movement of the water, the trains passing overhead and the flapping wings of the, of the swan. Rhetorically, the song seeks to entrain or persuade the body of the passerby into the position of empathetic listener rather than user or consumer of the bridge. And it makes apparent his or her position as just another listening, moving body within an environment of listening, moving bodies like the swans. Whereas a concert within a hall or even an outdoor pavilion <coughs> may create a community of hum human listeners with a shared sense of a particular song. 
Phillips Ballet creates an experience of a more diverse human and non-human listening community, highlighting, highlighting the participation of the architecture and water birds, as well as other humans arriving on foot and bicycle. Through the movement of Phillips' voice, boundaries between nature and culture, exterior and interior, become permeable. Loberry describes this phenomenon in her book on the ethics of listening. <coughs> the voice of the other, unlike the face of the other, is invisible and cannot be seen. It, is not one, it has not one but many surfaces, and it reverberates with the echoes of all the other voices, past and present, heard and unheard. As sound, the voice of the other is a wave of energy that surrounds me, enters me. But unlike the exteriority of the face, which preserves the subject-object dualism of the seeing and the seeing, the voice of the other mingles inextricably, crossing through semi-permeable boundaries between inner and outer. Unlike Krauss, who archives the now extinct sounds of disappearing environments, Phillips draws attention to the ephemeral boundaries of both past and present, and to the traditional ways humans have related to the planet's waterways, like the sea or river. If we listen to her installation through the growing intensity of this decade's superstorms and coastal disasters, we could understand the ballad not just as a way <coughs> to memorialize 16th century sailors, but also as a way to memorialize the disappearing coastlines and their inhabitants. Phillips discusses her work as sound sculpture, but it's a rhetorical medium that decays and changes and echoes and reverberations. The human intonations in her voice recordings are fragile, and by the time the passerbyers <laughs> encounter her voice singing lowlands away, they hear it as echo as already changed and sustained by the stone architecture. The echoes create the effect of not only a disappearing present, but a disappearing way of keeping time. In other words, one sense is not just another time period, but a whole other cyclical way of marking the pass, passing of time. The same impulse is evident in Day is Done. Um, I'm just gonna see, is, has anyone been to Day is Done on Governor's Island? No been there for a year now, and I did not receive the grant to go yet. Um, and I just want to bring it up because she got, she's doing similar things with Governor's Island, so it really helps me make the point. Um, they haven't made a video of it yet, but there she is posing next to one of the speaker's sisters. <coughs> there are two speaker systems on the, on opposite sides of Governor's Island. And this is an aerial view of the island. Only if one is leaving on a 6 p.m. ferry can they actually hear the song taps. Otherwise, they're just hearing fragments of the song as they're moving around the island. As in Lowlands Away, Phillips uses rhetorical strategies to project sound within an environment where it's amplified and absorbed. What one hears depends on where one is located. On the, on the island, one hears fragments of the military memorial song, while on the ferry, one hears then recognizes the song in its totality, a kind of musical souvenir, identifying the place visited as worthy of memorialization. It is, however, a permeable package. The complete harmonic sequence of taps only happens from a particular movement off the island, and then it continues resonating through the air and water via ship horns on the bay, and she had no idea that ship horns actually were carrying some of the same tones as the song. In making sense of the song, sound, we immediately notice the space we're inhabiting, and what was ambient suddenly becomes salient. This kind of sonic disorientation is such a useful rhetorical strategy that cities like Dallas are installed, installing disembodied sounds like jungle sounds in, on, um, among busy intersections to alert joggers and pedestrians to traffic. The, the signs are no longer working, so they're resorting to sonic interruption and disorientation. What kind of sounds did you say? Jungle sounds. Jungle sounds. Like a tiger. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Danger. Right. Okay. Not like, yeah, tweeting birds. Um, what makes Phillips' work less utilitarian, however, is its fragmented and ethereal qualities. It doesn't layer one public space on top of another in order to simply, simply alert us to danger, but layers a private, intimate sound, whether it's the unaccompanied, disembodied female voice or the rich notes of a vibraphone, which is what she uses in Day Has Done. Um, layers this private, intimate sound onto a public place in order to disorient us from our habitual ways of listening. The sound source is an absent body, yet very physical in its tenuousness and hesitancy making us more aware of our own bodies and environments. Unlike the seamless background hum of Muzak, Phillips's fragmented melody interrupts our routine of relationship and interrogates our image-saturated approach to the world as landscape, a landscape that is manipulable and extractable. However, Phillips is doing more than simply asserting the power of sound. She's actually asserting the power of objects to manipulate our attention. It's not the backgrounding of sound that she mourns, it's that we're not even aware of the process of backgrounding. So what does this awareness actually help us do? It, our, I argue it attunes us to a rhythm, engages us in a form of what Brazilian philosopher Benero dos Santos calls rhythm analysis, a sense of a more than human pacing, a sense of the disappearing present and an inkling of a future without us in it. <clears throat> While Phillips' projects could invoke this nostalgic longing for a perfect past, they might also invoke a particular kind of mourning, one that recognizes the present as always passing and the future as less certain. By contrast, Krauss's work offers a clear trajectory of soundscapes before human impact and after. In so doing, he also creates a sense of what the world might sound like without human interference. Krauss's focus his efforts on capturing the full range of voices within particular ecosystems. An experienced musician he uses the metaphor of the orchestra to describe the varying features and tones of forest soundscapes, attributing each group of animals, like wolves, baboons, barred owls, with rhetorical agency. That is, the ability to use the best available times of the day and the natural architectures to communicate effectively. With his carefully situated stereo microphones, Krauss seeks to record the whole ecos ecosystem, or what he calls the biophony, his term for the sounds of living organisms. And I'll just play a little bit more of this, yes, a sense of the wild century. that you shouldn't play those during mating season or migrating <laughs> season for birds. It's, it's a serious warning because they tend to act erratically to, this, to these sounds. And when I heard that, um, I became very interested in the sounds that we've used to um, manipulate and regulate wildlife. I'm teaching at the South Campus and they have this whole wall on the CU Denver South Campus of called Managing Eden, I couldn't resist. Um, but here are some of the, a lot of them are sound objects and artifacts like bells, and as you can imagine, um, supersonic dog whistles, etc. So that's a whole other aspect of my research, how we use sound to manage the wildlife <laughs> and landscapes, not just how we express them. Um, Capturing the biophony of a particular natural soundscape, Krauss argues, can actually communicate the health of an ecosystem just as well as a still photograph. His recordings of Lincoln Meadow in the Sierra Nevada mountains before and after selective logging, for example, demonstrate that radical shift in the biophony. It was obvious that the once sonorous voice of the meadow had vanished. Gone was the thriving density and diversity of birds. Krauss's other work 
includes marine environments where the health of an ecosystem can't be captured with a photograph or map. In Krauss's hands, the microphone replaces the microscope as the instrument of discovery and proof of human impact. Similar projects proliferate in an attempt to materialize what has been lost, like the Cornell Library of Sounds, or Hempton's Inch of Silence. The goal of these projects, paradoxical in a way, is to capture and preserve the other in order to emphasize its ephemerality and its sensitivity. The hope is if we understand the non-human as sensitive like we are, our perspective and thus use of the environment may become more adaptive and less toxic. And I'm concluding with a call out. Krauss, more than Phillips, include, invokes a traditional form of listening, requiring us to discern the details of an environment along with its overall to tone. But both artists place meaning on the transiency of objects, coastlines, meadows, rivers, each with different time scales. While Krauss participates in the larger project of rendering ecosystems sensitive, Philip uses sound to draw attention to the indeterminacy of our own sense perceptions. And although both are engaged in archival work, Philip splits in layers of sound of history and culture, inducing different le levels of recognition depending on where one is standing, boating, swimming, or walking. The effect is the memorialization of human perception itself. With her first person vocals projected into public space, Phillips invokes the rhetorical position of eavesdropping more than discriminating listening, which at the risk of sounding morose may be the most appropriate rhetorical position for humans on their way out. <laughs> A 2013 sound piece entitled A Song of Our Warming Planet communicates this vanishing position more directly. Cellist and University of Minnesota student Daniel Crawford collects NASA surface temperatures data, temperature data from 1880 to 2012, and links each 0.03 degrees Celsius rise in temperature with an ascending cup tone. And I'm just going to play the whole three minutes for you. scientists have a standard toolbox to <coughs> communicate their data. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to add another tool to that toolbox, another way to communicate these ideas to the people who might get more out of this than out of maps, graphs, and numbers. Climate change is a defining issue of our generation, and it's still something that a lot of people don't fully understand. And what we're trying to do is to represent the music, sort of the immediacy and the importance that this issue has right now. And if we act on that, then maybe it won't be as much of an issue for the future.
mind, right? <laughs> um, so an alternative to charts and graphs showing increased temperatures, this song is in direct um, uh, parallel with the Al Gore chart at the beginning. The song invites the individual hearer to tune into the inter interlocutor earth long enough to recognize humanity's own metaphorical passing ability to hear. If it's true that hearing is the last sense to dissolve as we lose consciousness, a song of our warming planet memorializes this transition on an even larger scale. As I give this talk, scores of movies and novels depicting the end of the world are being published near, I mean, they have for the last century, right? And our public, newspapers are publishing nearly daily reports of extinction and disasters. Well, how might teachers and scholars address this influx of information dealing with the age of human impact. What sort of rhetoric is up to the task of refiguring human agency as a geological force? Certainly the rhetorics of mastery have seen their day, and an ethos of transcorporeality, vulnerability, and dependency has emerged, an ethos that benefits from a critical sonic rhetoric, a way of hearing and resonating with the ongoing shifts in environment, species, and language. Right now, writers and cultural workers are scrambling for the usual crisis <coughs> positions, advocating for technological solutions, redirecting consumption toward green products, preaching the end times, fantasizing a zombie apocalypse. Indeed, the Anthropocene debates are replete with anxieties over how we will be read by the next generation or after extinction, whatever comes first. So what I've offered here is an alternative response to this debate, a critical sonic rhetoric that upsets dreams of human supremacy or even annihilation, and celebrates change and contingency, enveloping humans in a complex soundscape of relations, birth and decay. It's a sonic rhetoric that embraces what philosopher Claire Colbert calls a counter ethics of extinction, which in effect is the ability to bear the gradual witnessing of a slow end, a disappearing present, without res resorting to fantasies of swish, swift destruction, rapture, rescue, or even endurance. Another philosopher, Karate Theo Mara, offers a less visual strategy that describes the kind of dynamic sonic witnessing that I've advocated here, a listening that involves the renunciation of a predominantly molding and ordering activity, a giving up sustained by the expectation of a new and different quality of relationship. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have a question, I just have a comment because uh, it was the experience of an artwork that made me realize how important and transformational the sonic experience is. And it, there are some connections with uh, the other components of this artwork that might be of interest to you. Sure. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, uh, Vietnamese artist Hundred Vasa, um, Hundred Waters, he gave himself the name. Um, it's mid mid twentieth century to later twentieth century kind of naturalist, um, and uh, he built <laughs> I guess the ego art, art, ego of the artist built his own museum yes, yes. <laughs> for his work <clears throat> because his work was very much about the building itself yeah. in Vienna, and um, there are different components to the space. I mean, he's a naturalist. He's a nudist. Um, so it's all very much about um, you know, our relationship to other um, species and to rhythms of nature and whatnot. Um, but he built the angles of the building a little off, so you always feel a little bit unstable. And he planted trees inside that then grew out the windows to just do away with this inside-outside. Um, and it's very, it's very famous for being very colorful, so everything is just bright primary colors and um, very beautiful. Um, so those are all the other dimensions, but the sonic component is that he would have running water in all the spaces, and um, for him this was always a way of kind of enticing us back to the most kind of profound connection we have to um, other, or to natural life. 
And it was really transformational to always be around the sound of water, running water. And it's like been a burden or a curse on me since then that I always want to be around running water. Um, and I feel its absence all the time mm -hmm. in the city. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that was the intended effect of the piece, and yeah. it worked. Decades yeah, later, to mark, <laughs> to mark still, the absence. Yeah. yeah, to mark the absence, and it was really, really profound. Mm -hmm. And and all the other things, the the color, that it it was, for me, I took it in at a different level. Like I intellectually noted it as being unique and interesting and innovative, but the sonic component like changed my expectations of. Uh, the spaces that I inhabit, yeah. and so no question. Just wanted to say that that was very yeah. Profound that, could me. I just comment too that um, sometimes <laughs> this sound artists use the visual as a distraction, so that you are penetrated mm. by the sound and more profoundly yeah. and unconsciously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So, um, man, for for a piece that makes me think as much as this does, thank you. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. One, I, I'm not sure I agree with some of the individuals who are arguing that sound has sort of taken this secondary position. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe that's true. For, for whom is it true, I guess, is my question. Yeah. Um, and secondly, I, I, I teach a wilderness class every Maymester. And in the last wilderness class, we were at Sky Pond. And we first heard um, the first of 10 avalanches before we saw them in the distance. And so it made me think of sound as figure versus sound as ground. So it sounds to me like you're sort of playing with the idea that in mm -hmm. at particular points in time, sound is prominent and then sound is background. But I'm also thinking of Aldo Leopold and the great naturalist who might say, an eco-feminist who might say that the researcher who's putting speakers into an environment and imposing is just another form of human dominance or domination over our soundscapes. And so respond to none or any of those kind. I mean, I'm just, I don't even know what I'm thinking yet about it. I'm just, yeah. all these things are going Well, in communication, so. <coughs> has always been important. In, yeah. in rhetoric and literary studies, I would say, it hasn't been studied um, as much. Um, and that's changing. Yeah, because I'm thinking of music, and I'm thinking, oh, well, yeah. you know, if we're talking yeah. about sound for the everyday, the kind of the yeah. prosaic notion of sound, then, I mean, I think that's a really great question to ask deeper questions about how sound infiltrates and our sort of everyday, and especially experiences yeah. like that that are yeah. prominent and memorable and, and influential. I mean, I think that's pretty amazing. I think if it were, um, if we were indeed conscious of sound and its effects on our system, that it wouldn't be as noisy. <laughs> so I don't think we are as a culture necessarily conscious. Yeah. And in fact, um, my next, hopefully my next project is working on the sonic regulation of fracking in Colorado, which they just put a random decibel on what's healthy, because no one knows anything about what's healthy or not, as far as the trucks rumbling through it and the drilling. Um, so I don't think we are as conscious about it even in the popular sphere, or the cultural sphere. Yeah. Yes, there's music, yeah. But, yeah, does someone want to chime in on that? <laughs> yeah. No? Well, there was an interesting study done. Um, I don't remember when it came out, but it was a book called Sonic Persuasion that talked yes. about our um, reaction to sound in an industrial age and how that was adopted into popular music, but people weren't really aware of that being an influence in music. So that's an interesting read to learn more about. That, that noise has been manipulated. Yeah. yeah. That's a whole other aspect of my work, too. Um, so, Larry, what about, yeah, I would say in answer to your question about human domination that these artists are drawing attention to that. <laughs> Say, I mean, if industrialization has had the impact that it's had at the scale it's had, how can we any longer discern what's human and not? I'm not engaging in intellectual play here either. I'm just yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. I'm just imagining that where do you sort of draw the line? questions of domination over the natural world. That would certainly yes. 
be yes. one of those that would be open to criticism because of the manipulation well, the of sound in, in yeah. unnatural ways. Oh, completely. And that's, and I'm sort of siding with Susan Phillips, even though she is not attempting a sort of natural right. soundscape like right. Bernie Krause. What's interesting about her work, too, though, is that it's wiped out on a regular basis. It was wiped out by Superstone Sandy um, a couple years ago. And her work in Tasmania has been wiped out by a coastal waterway. So it's kind of interesting. For me, that's part of the dialogue. Stronger sounds <laughs> between are wiping her. out her artificial humans. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's something right. which is right, kind of cool right. to yeah. think about. Yeah. But she was already working on spaces that were already modified, modified. by humans. Yeah. It's not like there was this pristine meadow, like, no, right. hey, we're going to throw yeah, yeah. a speaker here, right, right. play some sepulchre. No, it's yeah. not like that. Like, she <laughs> was calling to calling into light all the changes and all the, like you said, the layering of, of what that yeah. waterway might have been like, what was going on there. Right. You know, right. And then right. Krause was more, I would say, more like the preservation. Right. And that was more of like being able to tell that story. Of like you can go see the meadow and you can see the logging and all that, but if you want a really profound, quick idea of how things have changed, just listen to this. So I think it was much more, what is the word, like Actually. historical than trying to impose. It's not trying to say that we're being, you know, dominance. It's trying to say this is the effect of what we've done. More we'll call uh, call that into perspective. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, as cities and towns start, there's an impulse to green cities now, and I mean, if you go to the Denver um, Botanic Gardens, they have a green roof there, and, and some cities are introducing this, and community gardens and other kinds of impulses like that. So I'm wondering if you know whether or not when a city or a town has a sort of increased awareness of the need to green the community, whether or not that brings with it an increased attention to light and sound pollution. Mm. Because you could imagine once you start to green things, you start to maybe want, you want to eliminate various forms of pollution that you weren't considering at the, at the get-go. That's a great question. I mean, it's also true that cities are full of people wearing iPods, so, you know, the same people who are doing a community garden are also, in a way, more cut, people are more cut off from one another in public spaces than they were before. So I don't know if maybe that would prevent, that would end run around the impulse to, to green their roof. Or, yeah, or you know, in response to the earbuds, um, just to pick up on that, I've had my students for the last 10 years do sound projects, and a lot of the women in my class wear ear earbuds so they won't be harassed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so uh -huh. that it's not to cut them off, uh -huh. it's to cut off that unwanted. So it's defensive uh -huh. in, this, in the general sense in the same way that all Walkmans are defensive. But they don't want to be cut off, you know. That's a choice. Um, and it's in nature, it's defensive not to wear them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah when you're jogging at night, <laughs> when you're jogging at night in the coyotes on your trail, you don't want your, your buds. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Once waterways and trash becomes more material and less valuable, do other less tangible things become more material? Uh, down there. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking of as like an interesting analog to Krauss to play like a short clip of like Smetana, you know, like like this is how we thought of music in the 17th century, you know, mm -hmm. and it's acoustic instruments imitating nature sounds, yes. and then play a clip of Sepultura, you know, with high gain metal grinding on metal, literally, to create the sound. Yes, yeah, I. I want to write the book <laughs> that includes all of those nature culture simulations. Yeah. Right, there's a whole history. Like guitar, plastic on metal getting converted into yeah. electrical signals pumping out speakers with high gain. Yeah, yeah. And, and I went to the um, Museum of Acoustic, no, the Museum of, in, in Phoenix, I can't remember the exact name of it. It's not just acoustic instruments. They had electric too. Um, 
but there they had a whole exhibit from the Victorian rush to create those mechanical birds that sound just like birds. And there's a whole like, display of all the different notes and the kinds of birds. And the mechanization of, uh, and computerization of that is a fascinating project that was disbanded except for a few people on the internet who still sell them. The Museum of Musical Instruments. <laughs> I recommend it. Of course, it's all acoustic. It's all you put on the headphones and you go from exhibit to exhibit. Oh, in Berlin, it's always entirely visual. The uh, music instrument museum. Uh, unless there's the cranky uh, docent who's there. You can't play some of the instruments. You largely just see them. That's fun. That's interesting. Oh, yes. I thought you were going to say it's time to go now. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, no, I, I, want, I want you to say more about mourning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because you described both Phillips and Krauss as offering forms of mourning. Mm -hmm. and, but they're, and they're also both offering forms of memorialization, but Krauss has a like, preserving or conservative, mm -hmm. like conservationist. Whereas maybe Phillips is more of a historian, maybe not the same way. Yeah, but it's a good way to divide them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It almost seems like you're offering, like, one way we can confront climate change is through, as an act of, of witnessing in the morning, and you're offering us objects through which we can. Uh, yeah, I really, uh, yeah, I really think, I mean, not that they intended it that way, but yeah, I think. A lot of Phillips's work is an elegy for the coastlands, and um, yeah, I think a, a lot of the feminist eco critics, including Alemo, um, suggest that that's the rhetorical posture that it should be one of grief and bearing witness. Um, I think some of it is a kind of strategic nostalgia, <coughs> which might be useful. That would be more callous. Well, they're mm -hmm. both priming us for nostalgia, right? Mm -hmm. But in quite different ways. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really do, I, I think Phillips is, and she's even, she even says this, is she's so interested in the coming and going of human perception and consciousness. So she's really playing with knowing our own limitations and what we can hear. And for me, that just suggests what a lot of eco-critics are saying now, which is we must understand ourselves this. And E.O. Wilson's saying this too. He's not my favorite guy, but we're just, the, the planet wasn't really made for us. <laughs> you know, it's, there's a fuller sound out there that we're not hearing. Yeah, and this is, that's how they make, Phillips offers us a memorialization of the specifically human. Limited human perception. Consciousness and perception, yeah. yeah. And Krauss is trying to offer something. Uh, Preservation, or, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, an archive. Yeah. Okay, that would be Oh. I just wanted to piggyback on and um, draw a little bit more focus to the, um, uh, the sound as a sense for the presence, our present. Um, that's something that it, um, I heard you say over and over again um, in different ways in the fact that it's the closest thing we can be to being in the moment whereas you know some of the other like sight smell things like mm -hmm. that um, they linger whereas sound it's there and then it's gone mm -hmm. like born I mean I know you said birth and decay continuously um, and so in order to hear you have to have an awareness in order to be in that moment at that specific point in time and to hear exactly or to pick up on the frequency, mm -hmm. the vibrations. You literally have to be in that moment. You have to be aware of what's going on. And I think that that is something that, you know, and you mentioned it many times, that can be used as a tool to say, hey, look, you know, we are here, you know, stick with me, you know, to listen is to be in the moment. Stick with me for this moment and then I can show you how we affect things that are going on around us mm -hmm. and how the things bounce off. Um, and like like echo, you know, the reverberations of the past, so to speak. So I just wanted to like 
throw that back out there, you know, because I think that that's immensely strong and right. powerful, right. Um, especially with moving people, especially with the emotional and persuasive attachment that it can have. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm just gonna throw that back out there. Thank you, and just to follow up, Susan Phillips says most of the people come up to her after the exhibit saying they were suddenly aware of the weather for some reason. So there's this kind of uh, bringing to consciousness of not just, you know, climate and the coastlines, but your immediate sure. present. I mean, if vibrations exist from the deepest parts of the ocean to the right. farthest reaches of the galaxy, then it only makes sense that, you know, I'm not going to, you know, piggyback on, on or negate any of the philosophers, but if you can't feel the vibrations, technically you don't exist. Like if you're not, you know, or if like you're not you're, making vibrations, or if you're not making vibrations, <laughs> then you, then you realistically, then yeah. you're. I don't want to say a black hole. It's not a physicist, but you know what I mean. Like you, you kind of don't exist, so to speak. Like you're not receiving, you're not giving any out. Um, and so, so then, what is the impact that that has? Yeah. On, you know, the environment? Yeah. Also, I was sorry. I was just going to say. I think those comments and then some of what you said resonates because it it suggests like organizational theorist Carl Light, but things sort of shock us out of our routine, mm -hmm. and those become cognitive occasions for sense making. And so when does sound intrude upon the routine or the malaise or the, the otherwise subconscious or unconscious ways of just going through our daily lives? So I mean, I definitely picked that up, and I think that's a strong point. I think to some extent you're echoing that. And I think that's, I mean, th I think those are great questions about what garners our attention in particular ways that are different than our kind of normative routine experience. Right. And I think sound does that, what you talked about. And I'd never seen an avalanche before, let alone heard one before the wilderness experience. And, you know, it's a definitely, it took me out of the sort of the regular sort of conversational, experiential moment oh, yeah. into that something shocking just happened. And sound. Mm -hmm. Like when people describe, I love tornadoes, I grew up in the Midwest and have been through numerous tornadoes. And, and those are like when you hear people describe the sound of tornadoes, it's, I mean, that's an event, that's a memorable event. That, Really? The last time I gave this talk was during a tornado <laughs> <laughs> in North Carolina. I had to yell. There were actually people who wanted to stay. Anyway, it was crazy. But yeah, and the Boulder flood was did that right. for me too. Right. It's, it's a event. Thank you. Both. I think I think philosophers are very much. I don't know. Philosophers in the room, correct me. Are amenable oh, we will. to we yeah. Will. Thank you. The, <laughs> amenable to the ontology. You know, the idea that vibration could be an ontology. That's not the problem. But what's useful about it, right? What's political or useful? We, well, I, yeah. I mean, I mean, what is the who is this Goodman person? Um, Stephen. Sorry, Stephen. Stephen. Stephen Goodman. And what? Um, because, um, you said about him that um, that he thinks that. That everything ultimately amounts to vibrations, and, this, and so essentially, um, yeah. So, um, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. But what what just struck me right there when you said that was, <coughs> you wanted to know why, why that would change anything if you if you believed in a, a process yeah, ontology or a vibration ontology or, uh, uh, rather than a than a substance ontology. What use would that be? And then your first question is, what political? And I, I'm thinking immediately. Well, I can tell you it, all kinds of scientific um, value that that comes from that sort of shift in ontology. And in fact, my my whole work on addiction is based on shifting from a substance to um, wow. a, yeah. a vibration or a, a sure. process ontology. And so mm -hmm. I think. From substance, because it's always because yeah. the problem with substance is that um, you can't ever get causation to anything except the very, very bottom level. So you couldn't really have an effective thing like a political movement. That it couldn't, it can't exist. It's only the result of lower level um, yeah. reductions. But with the process ontology, um, every different level of, of explication has its own categories, its own value. And mm -hmm. so when we're talking about um, about climate change, we can be talking about that at the level of, of, of individuals, a level of groups, mm -hmm. the scale. Level, um, yeah. Absolutely, every every level. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, and just to chime in on that, um, so if you look at people who write on aesthetics and philosophy of food, there's a nice book by Carolyn Korsmeyer where she talks about the hierarchy of the senses because traditionally if you want to write about taste and smell, they're towards the bottom of what people appreciate and estimate as valuable. And, but there's a whole hierarchy of the senses that go with it. And, um, and so when you start to critique that hierarchy, you know, sound gets discussed in a way discussed in a way that's um, that maybe sh shows that it's not second to sight, but that it's um, you know it has it has some capacities and capabilities that sight doesn't have. And just because Candace mentioned process ontology, you know, Whitehead had a fully worked out process ontology, and he yeah. talks about, but he doesn't. Um, he doesn't talk about everything being vibration in some, you know, uh, homogenous way. He talks about the difference between perception is, on the one hand, you have the perception in the mode of presentational immediacy, that's sight, and then you have perception in the mode of causal efficacy, where you, know, you feel things. And sound is in this interesting position, uh, this is what made me think of the hierarchy of senses, sound is in this interesting position between sight and touch. Because it, it has sound, has presentational immediacy, but it also has this this underlying, and that's what I think jolts us, is that <coughs> that you know that sound is also could also impede you know that avalanche could crush you, uh, yeah, okay. and so there's touches immediately drawn into it. Whereas yeah. a lot of people are frozen at the sight of a disaster unfolding because they're mesmerized by the spectacle, but they hear if they hear the sound of the car coming they at them, the they jump out of the way before they even know what they're doing. Right. And you feel, I mean, that, that was a thing. I used to go to metal shows all the time. And um, the, the way that the music hits you in those, mm -hmm. those environments is not like, it has very little to do with your, well, it has a lot to do with your ears because, you know, they're going to be ringing for some days. But that's <laughs> not really where you hear it. You hear it in your feet and in your uh -huh. legs. And, um, you just meant to vibrate like a particle. You do. Yeah. 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 And the, the hierarchy of sound got me thinking, and what I really appreciated about the Phillips piece on the bridge is that it didn't try to isolate the sound, but it made it part of an experience where the sound gives a different context to what you see and what you feel. And I think that's an important thing that it's never just one sense, it's one sense right. against the four other senses. Right, they're using the other right. senses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Laura, I really liked the cello documenting climate change and mm -hmm. global mm -hmm. warming. And that visual, the, the sound, but also the, the visual and just the story behind it, really made me think about the rest of it is human interpretation of what's happening and using sound to communicate. But I believe the earth is communicating all the time and vibrating all the time. And the sound that is being captured is in the air. It is above the surface of the earth. Seeing that cello, I suddenly thought, what if scientists, or these artists, but scientists, more longitudinal studies, would actually put subterranean mics into ecosystems and document change over time, and then be able to replicate that as an example of this is what, these are the vibrations yeah. emanating yeah. from these ecosystems. This is how they are communicating. This is what is happening over a period of time, and then to, have a, a means of visualizing that in mm -hmm. the same way the cello was. I think that could have an impact because we, we're conscious of what we hear in the air. We are conscious to the sounds that only we can hear, but the vibrations and in the world are so much greater than what we sense. So we're missing so much. How do we capture that? How do we begin to communicate those living organisms and the sounds they're creating as a part of the voices mm -hmm. that are speaking daily, you know, every second about what's happening to our earth. Yeah. And how then to translate that so people could see it, I think would be fascinating and yeah. wonderful and, and political. Yeah, there are <laughs> um, sound engineers who are dedicated to doing that. Yeah. 
um, capturing the smallest voices. And then there are sound engineers dedicated to sonic, literal sonic warfare, just right. becoming more economical um, other forms of warfare. Final question. We continue the conversation over snacks. <laughs> crunching, snacks? crunching, and grinding. Yeah, snacks. let's thank yeah. Michelle one more time for it. <laughs> Crazy wealth disparities, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so you have to see some of the yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Um I'm visiting the uh Can I smoke a cigarette with you? Oh, yep. Tell us how much money I get. And then they are thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. Right? That's so amazing. I'm from Indonesia. So I listened to the Bagarian Opera uh, uh, at Banner Station. Oh my god, you haven't got into Banner? Yeah. 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 Oh, congratulations. <laughs> That's awesome. It's so early. So yeah, that's early. early. The first guy. It's so early. Yeah. That's amazing. We're beginning of February. 